Aloha, party people. You are listening to Inside the Desert Oasis Room, episode number 203. This episode is sponsored by the Tiki Bar T-Shirt Club, where their monthly T-shirt designs pay tribute to a Polynesian bar or restaurant from days long past. Each design is available for a limited time and will never be produced again. For the collectors out there, be sure to check out their subscription program, where they offer a discounted 3, 6, or 12-month plan, or you can always buy shirts one at a time. For more information and to check out this month's shirt, visit tikibartshirtclub.com. If you have a product, service, or event that you'd like to bring attention to, we can help. This podcast reaches thousands of listeners in over 100 countries every week. Imagine hearing your ad in this spot, just like you're hearing this one right now. Sponsor an episode and get the exposure you deserve. For more information, go to DesertOasisRoom.com and click on Services. Today, we chat with the crew from Trademark Brewing. Owner and founder, Sterling Steffen and brewers, Valerie Aidy and Danny Jimenez, join us inside the Desert Oasis Room to chat about the origins of Trademark Brewing, their backgrounds in beer and hospitality, what goes into the creation and production of their products, and the inside scoop on how we collaborated on the Mango Smash beer we just recently launched together. As always, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as we did bringing it to you. If you enjoy this podcast, please stop by DesertOasisRoom.com and click on the tip jar. Every tip or donation, no matter the size, is very much appreciated and helps keep this podcast coming to you every week. And if you'd like to follow our adventures, check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Polynesian Pop, where we chronicle events, bars, travel spots, cocktail tutorials, and more. All righty, let's get into this. Pour yourself an ice cold beer and join us inside the Desert Oasis Room as we welcome the Dream Team from Trademark Brewing. Adrian, how's it going? It's going good. Aloha. Hey, Adrian. Hey, Sterling. I have uh, Val on the line also. Perfect. And uh, so I'm going to bring in Danny here. Danny, how hey, you doing? Hey, Adrian. All righty. I got Danny on the line. All aboard. So we have Fabulous. everybody here. Yeah, so, yeah, I forgot it's 8 o'clock, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's that time. Definitely. Aloha. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Thanks for joining the podcast. Our pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of buzz from the Tiki community, and so I wanted to do this episode to further educate people on what you guys do and who you are and all that kind of stuff. I think you guys are uh, uh, one of the gems of Southern California, and I want to have everybody learn about this brewery and your products and all that. So um, let me start by saying thank you for doing this collaboration with us inside the Desert Oasis Room. That was a, that was a fun event we had when the beer was released, and it was a, a fun uh, thing to do together. The beer came out awesome as well. I love it. I'm so glad you like how it turned out. I was really happy with it, too. Yeah, yeah. If I'm being honest, I was a little bit nervous because, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay. That's a big endorsement to put on there. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing your chips into one basket, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But, man, people are really loving it. Actually, Mike Sr. from the Tiki Teak wouldn't stop raving about it. He kept really? saying, yeah, he just kept saying, you yeah, know, this is really good. This is really, really good. And oh, so, that makes me so happy. Yeah, so we're, we're going to get them out there on a field trip uh, with some of oh, the other guys yeah. there. And I'll let you know when that happens so we can all be together and drink beer in the brewery together. 
So um, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So how's the response been since the event? What did you guys think of the event, by the way? It's so the event was very successful. I think we had a, a really packed house. The, yeah. uh, the Tiki community rolls deep. It was really impressive and cool to see. Yeah. Uh, as as uh, saying with Grace, a, a Tiki outsider, it was really interesting to watch from the outside and see everything kind of come together at once. Um, I was just so blown away by the outpouring of support and the, the beer, you know, after that blissful Sunday has continued to just fly. I love um, it. I love it. We better get whoever wants to get it. They, they better not wait. Oh, they better get it now. OK, so we're going to put a word out there to make sure that people get it before it's all gone. That event, I got uh, also so much positive feedback. Not only did people love the beer, but they loved the venue. <laughs> People were raving about how great the brewery is. And, you know, I think a lot of the Tika community was excited about having something that was different. You know, they're at a brewery where they normally are not. And it's you just have such a, a very fun, interesting, functional space. And people were asking me, are, are we going to be doing more of these here? This is a great place to do events. So, um I'm hoping that we do, but I, I wanted you guys to hear that because I am getting a lot of positive feedback on the brewery, just the brewery itself. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I want to talk about your guys' history because you guys have a really great product offering, and I want to know how all of that got started between the three of you. I know that you all have kind of different backgrounds coming into beer. And I wanted to kind of explore that. Who who wants to start with telling me their origin story? So I should probably jump in here because it's kind of a it's 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 an unusual sequence of events here. Okay. Um, and, and I think there's actually something fun in here that uh, that is a little known kind of hidden gem of, of how this all came to be. So uh, trademark was founded by uh, me and my wife Alana. And we opened doors in the summer of 2019. It was a long, involved process. I'll spare everyone that part of the story. Um, part of the process, though, that's relevant to this discussion, though, is how I met Val and how Danny enjoyed, or how Danny, Danny joined the fold, right? So I started homebrewing back in 2020. I don't even remember. Or, sorry, 2010. I don't even remember anymore. It's been that okay. long. Okay. I started homebrewing. I got involved in the beer scene. I thought maybe I want to do this. This is a crazy idea. Maybe I should, you know, you know, ditch my other career and find something new. In that process, I got hooked up with other breweries. And through that, I met Val when she was working at Firestone Walker and she was brewing there. That happened in the background. Val became a wonderfully accomplished brewer on her own with Firestone. And at the same time, we pushed through and built pretty much from the ground up. Danny was like number number one through five on the team. He was one of our first hires. He joined on a front house position. And Danny is a go-to guy that can get anything done in the brewery. And he's kind of migrated this wonderful path of you know, tying and tasting every little bit of the brewery to make sure that everything's happening perfectly and knows how everything operates. Right. And the kind of those three pieces of the puzzle. It's, it's a really cool thing that you don't see very often. That is an interesting series of events. I have lots of comments there because, first of all, this is a crazy venture, right? Going into opening a brewery, I mean, I'm looking around. Just the building alone has got to be a pretty penny. And then I'm looking at all of the equipment, the tanks and all the plumbing that had to be installed and just the expense of opening the doors, it seems <laughs> It seems like one of these is like, okay, are, are we sure we want to do this? Did you ever have second thoughts about that? I wouldn't say second thoughts, but there were definitely a handful of moments that were especially surreal. Yeah. Um, I remember the day that we stood up the brew tanks. Um, we, we did a lot of the construction ourselves, not, not the heavy duty stuff, but there, was a, there were a handful of small projects that at a point of pride, we wanted to do ourselves sure. or quite honestly, because we knew we didn't need to pay anyone else to do it. 
Yeah, I'm sure and budget had to do to, with that too, right? I mean, like there are things where you just say like, okay, it's going to cost this much to pay somebody. Let's just do it well, ourselves. Yes and no, actually. That's the funny part is that in some regards, it would have been done faster by professionals, okay. but sometimes we had the luxury of time. Uh, okay. Um, okay. If, you're, if, if you're waiting on someone else to finish their job, like, well, we're going to do this. And um, that was a really cool instance of standing up the tanks. We had, uh, I think, three other breweries show up. We had uh, Kip, who was with LA Airworks at the time. We had 10 Miles show up. We had uh, Long Beach Beer Lab. Well, that's pretty uh, cool. A, yeah, it's, it's super cool. And there's a guy in the community um, uh, who I actually won't mention his name because I don't know if he wants to be highlighted because everyone's going to call him after this. Um, but he's a, he does this for a living. And he's like, you know what? I'm glad to help you guys. And he was pro as heck and he showed up got in the forklift like it was a boss um he stood up three of the tanks like it was no big deal wow. and then he's like all right sterling i'm going to show you how to stand these up and it was this incredible choreographed moment and this in the sixth tank actually basically you don't do it by yourself but i i i was running the show for the sixth tank which is really cool and, and alana and i had this moment where we're standing there like Holy shit. <laughs> I love it. This is happening. Like, like, okay, I guess we're going to have a brewery now. <laughs> I love this is it. Really happening. I love it. I love it. So before we go too much further, I want to know also about Val and Danny's backgrounds. Um, why don't we talk to Val next? Tell us about how you got into brewing beer. Yeah. Um, well, I got into brewing beer from serving beer. Um, I have been in the service industry since I joined the workforce, um, got into bartending when I was 22, um, did a lot of craft cocktail bartending, um, which was fun and challenging, but, um, I very specifically remember my first like heavy duty bartending job. I happened to live down the street from this little dive bar that had, uh, 30 different rotating draft lines and 50 cent boneless wings on Wednesdays. <laughs> and so I used to go after my shift and get a whole a whole bunch of boneless wings and I would yeah. see what they had on that was new because they rotated every week. So it was $6 craft pints and um so I could go try, you know, two or three beers and try something new every week. And so that was really uh the the place that made me fall in love with craft beer. And then at some point, I think I needed a change, and I had been going to a specific brewery in Arizona for a while. I was the regular there, and at some point, it just clicked with me that, like, I should be working in a brewery. I'm, I'm obsessed with beer. I'm always, like, watching the brewers while they're doing stuff in the back of the house. Like, I would love to learn more about it. Like, why don't I try to work at one? So I got a job at a local brewery as a bartender, which led to another job at another local brewery as uh, their founding bartender. I helped open the building. Um, and then I helped run their front of house program as well. And that was my last job in Arizona before I moved to California. Um, I got lucky enough to get in on the ground floor uh, at Firestone Walker, uh, the propagator location here in Venice Marina del Rey area. And I got hired as their bartender. Um, but I made friends with the brewer really fast. They had only sent down one person mm -hmm. and he was feeling very overwhelmed. So we were having a beer together one night and he was just like, I need help. Like, I don't know, you know, they're not really trying to hire somebody full time, but I just need to find someone who wants to get their hands wet every once in a while. And I was like, Hey man, like I would love to learn more. I'd love to, you know, help you out and take some stuff off your plate. So if you ever, you know, want to show me the ropes, like I'd, I'd love to pick it up. Um, so I think I'm actually kind of an anomaly that I was not a home brewer. I had definitely attended a couple of home brews with friends, but was never an avid home brewer. Um, and yeah, I just kind of got on the job training. I got lucky enough to start being an apprentice on brew days and then just started picking up more and more responsibilities in the brewery. They started offering me more and more hours until I eventually managed to finagle my way into a full-time position there, um, which was fantastic. I got awarded a scholarship to the Siebel Institute in Chicago, oh, uh, wow. their advanced brewing theory program, okay. um, which is where I got my scientific education on brewing. And then, yeah, I, I got promoted from basically seller person to assistant brewer to just brewer uh, at Firestone. And then that would be when Sterling comes into the fold. And, um, you know, I'd kind of reached the top of my ladder there. Um, 
Right. There was nowhere, there was nowhere really for me, nowhere else for me to go in terms of growing there due to the fact that it's a two person staff and the person above me was very happy in their position. So I'd been exploring, you know, some growth options and opportunities and happened to ask Sterling if I could use him as a reference on my resume. And he responded only if I told him where I was planning on going and why it wasn't a trademark. So that opened that <laughs> door it. and I walked through that door happily and uh, yeah, here we are. So I should say, I, so I'm going to expose you here real quick, Sterling. Val, oh. so here's, here's something that Sterling said about you, Val, when I was at the brewery and, I, and it was just Sterling and I talking. I don't know how this came up, but Sterling said something like, yeah, there was, Val was the one. He's like, I, I wanted her here. She's the one that uh, I wanted. So, um, you know, I, I guess your reputation precedes you because, um, you know, Sterling wanted you there. And I, and I could see why when I was there with you guys for the few days that I was there um, in the brewery. I was overwhelmed with how much goes into making beer because, you know, I hear about, I have buddies who make beer. I have friends that are in the Long Beach uh, Home Brewers Club. I I don't know the official name, but there is a club where they're doing that. And, you know, one of them uh, entered a couple of his beers in the OC Fair and won some awards. And they do brew days in his garage and all of that. And... You know, I uh, obviously I don't know what goes into brewing beer like you guys, but I always thought that it was just this fun thing that they do. But I look at how much goes into it, and there's so much science and and what would I say like chemistry uh, with with yeah. the way things react with each other. And so I was I was seriously impressed. And then I hear this story about Danny that came from the the front of the house and then went to the back of the house. And I was impressed by that, too, because I, I, I think I remember asking you, Val, like, I mean, is there courses in this? How do people learn how to do this? Right. It, yeah. Yeah. It's it's so complex. So tell me your story, Danny. How, how did this happen for you? Uh, so I, for 10 years, worked in the grocery business, nowhere near service industry or brewing. Um, we did that for a long time. I, I ironically didn't start drinking till I was 21, I guess. That's the legal way to do it, but, but I did. I like how you added, uh, the, the, added the one on, on the 20. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then uh, doing that and working at a grocery store, seeing like all the kinds of beers, I was really interested and just started buying different ones to try to be like, oh, what do I like? Like, there's so much. And then just kind of got that bug of like, there's so many options and varieties out there and I wanted to try them all. Um, then stepping up from that, going to actual visit local breweries and enjoying that a lot. And then one day it hit me like, why am I not in this industry? Um, also because as Sterling mentioned earlier, I, I got one of those like, Oh, make beer at home for Christmas. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Uh, which are, really simplified but i did that and got me excited and i did start doing some home brewing at home as well uh how did those first ones I, come out at home out of, uh, uh drinkable, drinkable okay all right i'll say that <laughs> i never put it into an award thing never thought it was good enough for that but um moved to long beach and ironically enough just googled like hey what's around me i want to like work in long beach and local and then i saw that trademark was trying to open up and then was able to contact them. And then ironically they're like, Hey, yeah, we're looking. So awesome. I got, hi- I got hired there, worked up front, uh, became a lead. So I worked up there for like over a year. Um, and then we, we got in the business of canning and needing to have stuff delivered. So I started doing that for them and the whole time just letting them know like, Hey, if you need any help in the back, I'm your guy. I want to want to be back there, get my hands dirty. And I love it. Try to learn. I love it. So finally I, that opportunity came up and Alan Sterling offered that seller position to me and I accepted and I haven't looked back yet. So I love it. Now, as somebody that is not a brewer, 
Uh, so obviously I'm coming from the outside and I'm, I'm more observing of what you guys are doing and less of participating because I don't know what I'm doing, obviously. And I, I have to say, you guys are a dream team of sorts, the three of you, because when I watch you work... I mean, you communicate, obviously, that's that's part of the success of what you do, but you also are able to just kind of read each other and just do what you're supposed to do without, you know what I'm saying? Like, you all have your own kind of flow and things get done. And We have a really good rhythm together, yeah, for sure. Yeah, rhythm, that's the right word, because when I was there on, say, the canning day, there was no do this, do that, Um, okay, what's next, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I'm the one who's asking those questions, but you guys are just in your flow, in your groove. I mean... Uh, and and it's it was it's interesting to see that you know it's it's like um it's almost like a symphony in a way you know um, and as as corny as that sounds but it, it it's really <laughs> interesting to see that or or it's just like yeah these guys are like you know you guys look like old pros you know doing doing what you do um, starting trademark though you know again seeing everything that you guys are doing today i'm sure it wasn't always like that um, oh th- there was definitely a laverne and shirley moment yeah yeah it's, uh lucy at the chocolate factory <laughs> uh, just, we, we, we've learned along the way. <laughs> what was that learning curve like i mean so so tell me about the good days and the bad days what were the things that worked out well for you and what were some of the things that did not work out well so the learning curve is steep. Um, I think the biggest thing that worked out the best for us on the, in the broadest sense is that we were really fortunate to have a lot of support from the LA Brewers Guild and from a handful of breweries that really took interest in us and shared their information and were really an open book and are, and are a great resource to just you know, share information. And some of it was really direct, like, hey, don't do this. And other things, okay. like, you know... I wish I had done this thing slightly yeah, differently. And you just pay yeah. attention to those things. And, you know, of all of those things, many things worked out really well. Um, a story, a small story that I like to tell is a time we were sizing our, our cooler, which we store where we store our finished beer. And I had a brewer said, you know, I think you find it really interesting that this cooler were six inches wider. I could fit an entire extra row of pallets. Oh, oh, cool. Really interesting. Noted, like pay attention to yeah. the details, right? And at the same time, you're asking about where things went wrong or could have gone better. And there really isn't like one direct thing that could have been different or better. It's more like a collection of small things that, uh, you know, Val was part of this whole thing where we we added uh, additional water taps, like water Mm supplies, like spigots, basically, in Mm -hmm. the brewery, proposing things down. This sounds like a small thing. Boy, I wish I did that the first time. It hurt paying for it later. But that uh, just makes okay. the canning process easier, right? It yeah. makes our lives yeah. better. Yeah. Um, so we were just so fortunate to have the support of the guild and to have the support of a, a handful of breweries that really just shared a lot of information with us and tried really hard to pay attention to those details and do our very best. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can imagine uh, the learning curve and the timing of the lear- learning curve as well because you tell me that you opened in summer of 2019. And- Correct. It was a... Uh, June 27th, I think. June 27th. And then less than a year later, you have to shut down. We go into COVID. And yeah, that was a pretty big moment. Yeah. Um, I remember exactly where I was sitting when we got the note. It was like the first day off. My, my wife and I had had off in a while. We were sitting at, uh, at a place in Long Beach, looking at the water, having a glass of wine. And we get the note. And it was like, oh, no, this is happening. Yeah, and I mean, the very next day, you, you got to just turn it all off. You probably invested a gazillion dollars and you're just starting to get going. And then, boom, everybody has to shut down. What was your initial reaction to that? I assume your heart dropped. <laughs> and uh, honestly, how did you we, recover we from we that? To make of it. It, was, it was tough because, you know, it, don't forget this started with, you know, uh, two weeks to you know, stop the spread or whatever it was. Whatever right. It was yeah. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Right. And well, that was ambitious. Kinda, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. And you know, in hindsight, it's 2020 and all that, but we knew two things. We knew that we had to prepare for the long haul in terms of the facility. 
Mm-hmm. And then we also knew we had to prepare for the long haul in terms of just figuring out how to operate the business, which are two different things. Okay. And it was like, we need to conserve money. Like we, we canceled trash service and, and, and cable TV the same day. Right. Okay. Um, at the same time we explored, how do we like, do we shut down our draft system? Because you know, that's a complex beast and all those, all those bells and whistles, do you clean it and purge it and just put it away and don't plan not to use it for a while? Or, you know, do you go to a beer delivery method? And, and that time we weren't in cans yet either. Like everything about that was just such a, it was, it was a focused panic moment. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know that we did it especially well or especially badly comparative to other breweries, but I don't think anyone really knew what they were doing to be honest. And, and I don't think, I think very few truly knew what we were getting into at the time. Oh, I think you're totally right about that. I think that some People were just kind of, they were deer in the headlights, right? But you guys were able to do something to be productive and still have a customer base. You guys were making hand sanitizer and stuff, right? So that was a big pivot for us. Um, we have been close with our friends over at Portuguese Ben. That's a distillery. Yeah, in yeah Portuguese we, We've known those guys for a while. And Simon, who's the... Uh, the spirits are over there. He called me on a Saturday morning. And remember, this is like week 1.2 of COVID. Okay. Right? And, you know, that's the time where you're kind of in shock and awe. You're, you know, you're not really sure what's going on. He calls me in the morning. He says, hey, I have this idea. Um, we can make hand sanitizer, but I need your help. And my my instantaneous answer is yes. Let's okay. just do this, figure it out. And, and our focus, quite honestly, like just brass tacks, is like how do we do the best we can do in this instance? And this wasn't about the business. This was about we have equipment that can make things, and what do people need? Oh, okay, that's let's awesome. Do this. That's awesome. So the way it works in hand sanitizer is you need strong alcohol, which we can't make. Um, we make you know mid strength alcohol. Mm-hmm. And to make strong alcohol on their end, they needed a ton of mid-strength, which they then distilled, right? Mm -hmm. However, their bottleneck was they didn't have a lot of fermentation capacity, but we had a ton. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we pivoted right away. Um, They gave us this recipe that was based on like a distiller's dream that just wouldn't really work in this instant. And since we came up with this crazy cocktail that was half malt, half sugar, um, and this weird amalgamation of different yeasts that we put together and we were making 15 percent beer uh about 1500 gallons every three days which mm-hmm. was like 10 times the capacity they could do because of just limitations they had and okay. we were brewing this i think three or four days a week wow and sending these like 300 gallon totes about two miles down the road to the distillery and they would distill this down to the 70% alcohol sanitizer that was needed. And that was distributed to first responders, Edison, Cal Fire, anyone that needed it. And we basically did it on a wholesale basis. This was, was not a, a profit making venture. Mm-hmm. It's like, how do we do the best we can? And it was great because we were doing a good thing. We learned about a lot about our equipment in the yeah. process. And we also, we're able to keep a lot of people on payroll during that period as well. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. So you guys are always pivoting. You, you, you have your, you have your learning day moments from when you opened the brewery and then you have to pivot and have learning day moments for making the hand sanitizer. (laughs) So, so that, that's crazy to me because it's like less than a year later, you have to change the product you're making in your, in your brewery every day. Did you have to retool I mean, anything or, I mean, was everything basically still the same? Everything was basically still the same. Um, what I touched on before, though, is, you know, in our normal brewing process, we don't make beer every, we, we don't turn a batch of beer every three days, right? Right, in the normal right. brewing process, it takes us close to a month or about a month okay. to make a batch of beer, right? However, because we were brewing three or four days a week, every single week for like six or eight weeks, we through sheer repetition, learned our equipment differently. Oh, but to your point before, gotcha. though, yeah. I got news for you. The industry is always changing. And while we are while we strive to make a really consistent product, and that's one thing that, you know, as a proprietor and, you know, whatever, 
I can be really proud of. I think that's something we do really well. And yeah. you know, a lot of credit uh, for that goes to, to Val and Danny for just, just making some killer beer, but we got to be nimble at the same time. Mm-hmm. And when we, when we shift gears, we can't just take a leap of faith and hope it's going to turn out. We have to take everything we've learned from every batch of beer we've made until that point and apply it, and make really educated decisions. And then we got to make something that people want to drink. Right. And that's, that's the biggest challenge. And that's one thing that as you know, the cheese in this operation, I'm super proud of the team and just, and what we've been able to do. Like I said, dream team. I mean, you guys are, there you, go. you guys are uh, killing it and, and the products are just fantastic. And I mean that sincerely. I want to talk about that. Tell us about your process when you come up with these products. Like what goes into choosing the flavors, the styles, are, are you doing this seasonal based? Are you doing things that are maybe like winter, fall and winter flavors and then spring and summer flavors? Or how, how do you guys go about choosing what you're going to make? So I'm um, going to turn this over to Val because this is a, this is part of the collaborative process. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on your Val, but that's, <laughs> yeah, that's for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, the deciding what to make is definitely a collaborative process. Um, we have weekly meetings with our leadership team, and in it we discuss, you know, each department gets their time to talk about how their week went and where we are and, like, where we are in production, what we have planned on the schedule and, you know, what we have coming up or opportunities we have coming up and do we want to take them or... Um, you know, that in conjunction with uh, Todd, our sales guy, who's also um, part of this dream team, we I don't think we would have survived the pandemic without Todd. He definitely was just crushing it for us in the market. Um, and but, he, he's out there on the street know, hearing what people want too, right? I'm, I'm sure that's exactly. part of it. Yeah. And that's a huge part of it too. You know, he, we, you know, open accounts and they're like, well, we would really love to give you another draft line. If you have a style that would be like this for us, you know, we would probably get that from you or, you know, he gets a lot of feedback from the liquor stores that we sell in or the grocery stores that we're in now. And um, so that definitely plays a role in uh, what we were making, but, you know, part of it is seasonal. Um, You know, for instance, we're going to have a Kolsch fest in March because that's a traditional time of year to, um, drink Kolsch and celebrate that beer. Um, We make an Oktoberfest in the autumn and that's, you know, a very traditional time of year for Mm -hmm. that beer. Um, We have a coconut porter that we release every fall because nothing goes better with nice crispy fall weather than a nice roasty porter. You know, we make, uh, we release a stout once a year in the winter time because, you know, stouts are a big boozy stout is really great on a cold winter night. And so, you know, you do kind of have to plan, what you think is going to move okay, uh, have, based I, on season. I have to stop you real but, quick you know, because all we these... aren't always locked into that either. There's plenty of other styles that we make year round, you know, right. IPAs are just because I love to drink hoppy beer. And so, you know, you're, um, you're killing me with these flavors that you, everything you're throwing out. I have to stop you and just say that. Like, nah, I want to try <laughs> all of it. I wanted everything that you've said. I want to try all of it because it sounds, <laughs> it all sounds delicious. Um, is there anything that you haven't made yet that you want to make? Oh yeah, I've got tons of beer I've not you have, made. You have that lots I of make. ideas. Um, lots of weird styles that are not super popular, so it's kind of hard to justify making on large scale format. Okay. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, a fun, another fun little tidbit about mine and Sterling's history. Um, so he and I met at a collaboration between Firestone and another brewery that um, that our mutual friend works for. But then he and I actually collabed. Firestone and Trademark did a collab um, when I was still brewing for Firestone. And we brewed an English mild Mm -hmm. um, or an English bitter, I guess you would call it. But it's uh, definitely what we call a brewer's beer. This is a not super popular style of beer amongst the masses. But every brewer I know loves to drink them. Um, They're light. They're really low ABV. Uh, So it's called a session beer. You're supposed to be able to drink several of them throughout the course of the day without getting yourself in a bad, in a bad way. So that's what session Um, means. I didn't know that. Okay. But, you know, I had a great time uh, helping come up with that recipe and then um, it came out really delicious and I loved drinking it. And I hear that we still have somebody that comes into trademark and asks if we're ever going to make it again. Okay. Um, So I, I would love to try my hand at another English mild. Uh, we've got some fun projects on our on our calendar coming up this year too that I'm really excited about. So, I love that. Yeah, stay tuned. We've got new stuff coming. Uh, what are your favorite beers in the tap room at the moment? Because 
when I was there, Danny was pouring me little samples of like, you know, he's like, oh, here, try this and try this and try this. And I loved all of them. And they're all uniquely different, but they were all very, very good. And it was hard for me to pick one. I think Danny will probably tell you a little bit about that. It was hard for me to pick just one because I loved them all. Do you guys have any favorites in there that you just like to drink again and again? Yeah, I would say, I mean, a la playa is yeah, that one's great. definitely a house house favorite. Um, it's our Mexican lager with lime and sea salt. I love it. And it is, it's definitely, especially in the hot weather months, like nothing satisfies after a long hot day in the warehouse, like a nice, nice crispy a la playa. That's probably my, my favorite warm weather go-to anyway. I love it. I love it. You had a desserty beer. I, I keep going back to it, that Radiant Beast. I really love that beer too. That one was so good. It it tastes like a Capri Sun. <laughs> it totally it's so awesome. So awesome. Uh and your painkiller smash, that one was great too. Um and yeah, then you I really had, fond of that one. You had one that was it had the number ten in it. Um it was ten kind of, hour stout. Yeah, yeah. That one was really good too. I mean, I can go on. Yeah, and that on. one's fun. That one's a uh, m- my first shot at revamping a uh, an imperial stout recipe, and I was really happy with how that came out. Really nice, full body, big and creamy, with really fresh. We roasted uh, that coffee was roasted and then put into the tank on the same day. Oh, really? So wow! You just get this insanely fresh roasted coffee character. We use artisan chocolate nib or cocoa nibs from a local. Um, chocolatier they're called letterpress chocolates oh yeah and so the yeah, quality yeah. of adjunct in that beer is just off the charts that's right I, I saw that letterpress logo on the back of the can yeah they do really great work i love it i love it so i want to talk about the future of you guys now sterling had mentioned that you guys are always pivoting things are always changing in the industry what do you think is the future of craft beer and microbrews like what you guys are doing sterling you want to feel that one? <laughs> oh boy that's a tough one I mean, <laughs> yep. our, we're talking about making uh 100 million cases of hard seltzer next year right <laughs> <laughs> yeah no. um i think i don't truly know where the industry is going right now okay to be perfectly honest i yeah. think that what we've witnessed in the last what we've seen, and by we, I mean trademark, and, you know, just to be more personal about it, because I have a different perspective than everyone else on the team, and where I started and where I think it's going are a bunch of different questions and answers. Sure. And the, the core, the, this is the core that I think uh, my colleagues will agree on, is that it really comes down to quality and flavor actually yeah. which seems really superficial but it's not and no i i don't think it's superficial either. Seltzer thing it's like did you really just want to get a cheap flavorless buzz yeah or do you yeah. want to enjoy something well and, I, I think that it's changed the expectation of the customer that they just expect so much more out of beer now you know and that's uh, absolutely true yeah and and I, mean, I, I, I would agree with that this, it's I'm raising the bar. Is actually, is, 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 is a COVID response, though. It's like, remember in COVID, the early days of COVID? I don't know about you, but I was like, cool, we're locking down for a couple of weeks. I'm going to go buy some steaks, and <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm going out in style, yeah. right? And, and, and it's really like, and now where our time with our, our friends and loved ones is, is limited or abbreviated or otherwise challenged by the you know, lasting effects of a pandemic, quality is important yeah and yeah the, the bar has been raised and we will only be as successful as our standards remain high yeah 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 i mean like the from what i see um it it just seems like there's just more and more expectation coming out of the coming from the customer from the kind of products that every brewery is is producing and so keeping to that standard, obviously, that's it's it's a necessary evil. Right. And I'm sure there will be challenges at times for that. But um, 
only those that make the best products and run their business the most prudently are going to survive because um, people just expect too much now. I, I would agree. Expectations are high. I think the beer industry is really interesting. In, I think it's a really unique industry amongst the food and beverage industry. Um, the evolution of it, especially right, since I've right. been watching it over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, it's, it's really fascinating in the way there's this ebb and flow that happens between the influence of the consumer and the influence of the brewer because you know the us brewers we got into this because we have a passion for beer and we want to consume it and we want to make what we like to consume and it's it's been interesting in the last you know i would say seven years or so well i guess really the last 10 you know the ipa craze that happened in the early 2000s Mm -hmm. where all of a sudden the market exploded with IPA and it was not the popular style until then. And then all of a sudden you see us launch forward into this new realm of hoppy beer making. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then hazy IPA became the thing. And so then West coast style kind of died for a while because everybody only wanted the haziest, juiciest thick boy with, you know, double dry hop with, and there is definitely still (laughs) a huge market for that. And that's definitely still a very popular style, but what we're seeing or what I'm seeing more of is the return of the West Coast style. Now people are like, ah, remember when hoppy beer was clean and clear and crisp and bitter? And, you know, brewers, we want to make lagers and pilsners because that's our favorite. And so, or that's a lot of our favorite anyway. I don't speak for everyone, obviously. But, you know, there's like Italian pilsners are on a huge on the rise in popularity because that's what brewers want to make. That's what brewers want to drink. And with the hop craze, I think we've kind of had a hand in pushing that style to the forefront so there's this really nice give and take where you know some of the maybe less educated about beer specifically demographic that you're trying to still appeal to because they're a beer drinker uh Mm -hmm. versus the the people that are really like knee deep in the industry or eyeballs deep however you know right like some of us whose entire life is beer basically yeah but i think it's got a really nice yeah, there's like a there's a duality there of where all of the influence is coming. And so it's always interesting to watch the, the industry continue to move forward. But with this nice push pull of, of who's who's leading the ship, so to speak. Got it. Got it. So what does 2022 look like for trademark brewing? Are, are there are there uh, products we can talk about just yet? Are there projects, anything like that, that we can um, that we can Tell our listeners I don't know about. how much I'm allowed to divulge here. <laughs> so maybe you should give this one to Sterling. So that's actually kind of a, a challenging question to answer, even though okay. it's going to be totally forthright. Um, we do have some new beers coming on. Okay. We may or may not have something that will particularly interest the TV enthusiasts. Okay. Um, I think your, your, your listeners and your fans are going to have to stay tuned for that one, though. Okay, I love um, it. I love it. Yeah, the tease, right? Yeah, um, I love we it. Do have a, we do a pretty stacked <laughs> schedule for next year. We're looking at releasing somewhere around 50 beers, um, give or take, give or take 10 or maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe plus 20. We don't know yet. Uh huh. Um, 2022 looks bright. It really does. I love we've it. Got, yeah, it, we've got a, a few irons in the fire that are really exciting. And uh, I don't think we should count our chickens before they hatch or the eggs, I guess. Okay. Um, but but look look for tiki on the horizon. Okay. And look for look for trademark being more broadly available um, to all of your you know your SoCal fans, and also look for some more limited stuff that's going to be a little bit tough to get, not because we're snobby, but just because we can only keep up the demand. That's exciting. Uh, so that's exciting. Well, it's it's it's, it's pretty cool. That's awesome. I, I want to throw myself out there and say, if you guys need a taste tester for any of this stuff that you're developing, <laughs> I'm just a phone call away. <laughs> you don't even have to call me. You could just text me <laughs> and I'll drive out okay. and, and I'll taste Come whatever whatever it is you need. You know what? We need an outside opinion. So I'm your guy. <laughs> your consultant. Yes, you'll be our flavor consultant. Flavor consultant and I'll do it for free. <laughs> Oh, man. I, I can't wait for that closing report. Uh, Adrian won't leave, guys. <laughs> this one needs more aloha. <laughs> well, before we wrap, 
first of all, let's start by pointing everybody to your social media pages. You guys are at Trademark Brewing. I know on Instagram, uh, the website's the same, right? Trademarkbrewing.com? Correct. All right. So if people want to go and learn about Trademark Brewing, uh, go to trademarkbrewing.com. You can get the hours, uh, the, the bios of some of the people that are there, the, the, the uh, brewery and all that kind of stuff, the products, I assume. Uh, but better yet, come down to Trademark Brewing in Long Beach and throw out the address for our listeners so those that are local can get that and come in. Sure thing. I'll give you the plug of plugs. So we're at yeah. 233 East Anaheim Street in Long Beach, uh, basically the top of downtown. We've got a great tap room. It's about 3,000 square feet. It's got a great viewing space of Val's Domain, which is brew house and the cellar. And in tandem, uh, she and Daniel are running that thing like a symphony. Um, our social media is trademarkbrewing.com, at trademarkbrewing, or trademarkbrew if you're a Twitter person. And also on our website, you can order our beer for shipping within California, as well as merch. And we also have, uh, depending on when this may air, we have our holiday gift box, which is our bourbon barrel aged uh, uh, hat trick, which is a Belgian triple, which is paired with some Belgian chocolates. And we're always doing something new there. So pay close attention. I love it. Well, I want to thank you guys one last time for allowing me to do a collab with you. I was honored that you accepted that proposal. And I really, really enjoyed meeting you and all of you and working with all of you and if there's ever a chance we can do that again i would just love to do that again and um, for all our listeners please come out if you're in southern california stop by long beach and check out trademark brewing and have one of their excellent beers i guarantee you will enjoy it for all the tiki fans we're on the same block as bamboo club so you can hit it <laughs> There you All go. in one fell swoop. There you go. Make a crawl out of it. <laughs> <laughs> what a night. Well, you guys have a great holiday. Have a safe new Thank year. You too. And I will probably find my way back in there before the end of the year. So I'm pretty sure I'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Adrian. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks again. All right, party people. Until the next time, cheers and aloha. Aloha.